if that had not ended, um, I would have started dancing. So this is a really good thing that that had a, a time limit on there. It's kind of groovy, groovy music. Welcome to week two of our core values study. And uh, just a reminder about why we should have core values. It seems pretty obvious. It's like, well, here's the core values, right? God gave them to us. We don't really need anything else. And that is true. Yet, every family has values, right? You have things that you do that are part of how you function as a family, how you interact with people who are not part of the family, that sometimes they're stated, sometimes you do these things on purpose, and sometimes they're they're not really intentional, they just kind of have worked their way into the fabric of your family life. And so we want to be intentional about our values, and we want to say them clearly so that we're all on the same page and moving in the same direction. And so last week, we talked about the value of being spirit-led. This is where we start, that we believe that God's Holy Spirit is available to all followers of Jesus to guide us and um, be with us. And so we wanna be led by God's Spirit. That's that's value number one. Today, we're gonna talk about being self-fed. Self-fed is our second value. I think um, we can agree that a human being that can feed themselves is mature and healthy, right? Um, when you have a baby and the baby cannot feed themselves, right? That's, that's sort of a precious time, right? But there comes a time when that's not appropriate any longer, when, when the child should be feeding themselves. And they often get there before the parent does, right? We, we go into this whole process and we're spoon feeding the baby food. And, and, and when what happens eventually? They're reaching for that spoon, right? They're like, nope, this is, I'm, it's my mouth. I'll take that. Thank you very much. And we, we kind of have this little tension, this little battle with this, with this small child for a while, because we're like, if you take the spoon, it's just going to be all over the kitchen. We can't, have you just throwing food? You're not quite ready, but they're, and it's like, I'm ready, but you're not ready. So we, we like that process of growing into a stage where you can feed yourself, right? And even, you know, um, as, as our children grow and, and, and we kind of give them the keys to the refrigerator, not literally, did, did any of you have locks on your refrigerator? I know you can do that now. Ooh, that would be, that's a, I'm gonna think about that one. Yes, sir. <laughs> We, we, want, we let them kind of just get what they need, right? So in our spiritual health, we need to feed ourselves. We, we can recognize that's a sign of maturity. We need to be able to proactively get spiritual nourishment and know where to go and how to do it, right? And the way we talk about that here is, is really just regularly connecting with God. That's how we're self-fed. We, we are regularly connecting with God through scripture and prayer, okay? It's not... Rocket science, we didn't reinvent anything with this, um, but I think we can sort of fall back sometimes and delegate this responsibility of our spiritual nourishment. And sometimes we delegate it to the church and we say, no, the, the church is supposed to feed me. And I can't tell you how many times as, as a, a preacher or a teacher, I've had people walk out and say, you know what? I really didn't get fed today. You didn't feed me, pastor. Um, and, and I do have a responsibility to offer something you know, true and helpful. Um, but if you're counting on me for all of your spiritual nourishment, you're going to starve to death, okay? <laughs> I'm just not equipped and capable to feed you all spiritually and keep you all healthy. At some point, you have got to reach for the spoon. You've got to know where to go and how to connect with God regularly through scripture and prayer so that you can be spiritually nourished. But I wanna give us a handle for that. What does that look like exactly? So we've got our our value of being uh, self-fed and the handle for today is to check our identity and direction, to check identity and direction. This is one aspect of connecting with God regularly that I think we need to build in to our rhythms. So um, I like... I like geography and I like geography games. So if you ever catch me playing a game on the uh, computer or my phone, it's either chess or a geography game of some kind. So the, have you guys ever heard of GeoGuessr? This is a geography game where it, it uses Google Maps and it just drops you down. You get this picture of somewhere in the world, anywhere in the world. And then you have to guess where you are. 
Um, and you can move the map, you can kind of look around, and it's kind of fun, and I, I enjoyed it for a while until I realized how terrible I am at it. It's so hard. And then I watch these YouTube videos of people who can do it in like five seconds. They just look around and they go, I'm in the south of Chile, you know? And you're like, how do you know that? So it's amazing. So we're gonna do a little Cicero version of GeoGuessr. Are you ready? So we're gonna show you a still image, and you're gonna try to guess where we are and then we're gonna move down the road and you're gonna try to guess where we're going. So um, try to figure out where we are. Don't say anything if you know where this is. Just, you know, be the smart, wise one in the room. And then we'll see where we're going. This is a um, somewhat familiar sight to me, but maybe not to all of you. So do you know where we are? And now let's move down the road and see where we're going. It kind of cheats, it gives you the street name there. That's not fair. Where do you think we're going? Oh, yeah, here we are, here we are. And there's the lake. Typically, if I'm going that direction, I, I don't stop till I get to Alexander's, but. Um, <laughs> so you get how, how it works. Let's do another one. We'll show you a picture. Oh, it's a bean field. That could be anywhere in Indiana, right? But it's in Cicero, so let's figure out where we're going. Try to, try to guess where we're going. sharp. Yeah. All right. We're going to cross the railroad tracks. We're going to get to this. Oh, it's school. Yay. Which school? So this is an old video. It doesn't even show the entrance to the high school, but there's the elementary school, Hamilton Heights Elementary. All right, let's do one more. This one should be easy. Uh, cornfield. Yep. Great. Where are we? <laughs> All right, let's go down the road. What road is this? Ooh, walking path. Yeah. There's a, oh, yep. Hey, there we are. Look at that, sure. Cicero. <laughs> <laughs> Got it, first try. You, you win the prize. Thank you, Nick. So this is just a little fun exercise so that you'll remember what we talked about today is that we're, we're trying to, when we connect with God, we, we wanna ask these questions. God, would you remind me who I am and where I'm going? Remind me who I am and where I'm going. So let's start with who, who am I? Who am I? And who gets to tell me who I am? Where do I go for that information, for the truth about who I am? So there are three options that we might turn to to tell us who we are. Um, who gets to tell us who we are? Well, one option would be they do. They, they do. Well, who, who's they? It, it could be anybody. It, it could be um, this group of people that you're a part of and you want to stay a part of and you want them to like you and respect you. And so um, they tell you who you are. They get to tell you your identity. It could be a group that you wish you were a part of and you're trying to get into because you, you respect them, you like them, or they have some kind of influence that you're looking for. And, and, and so you, you begin to, what we begin to do when we let them tell us who we are is we begin to manage our image, right? Um, this is what social media is really all about. It's an opportunity to manage your image. And you get to decide what other people see about you and you shape that image based on what you think is gonna get positive feedback from the people you respect, right? So we do this image management thing and it's exhausting, isn't it? I mean, you can't really keep up because people change their minds about what they really care about and what's popular and what's fashionable and which political views are in and out at any different moment. And you just, you just can't keep up when you let them tell you who you are. Another uh, source that we go to is ourselves. Who gets to tell me who I am? I do. I get to tell me who I am. And, and this sort of comes out of this recognition that it's unhealthy to let other people tell me who I am. Therefore, it seems like the only choice left is to let me tell me who I am. I just look deep inside myself. I be true to myself and then I express myself in whatever way seems best to me. Uh, this would make sense if we had any clue about who we really are. <laughs> but we go through seasons in life when we have no idea. You know, I, I mean, when you were 12, 10, 8, if someone said, just look deep inside yourself, you know, that's, that's who you really are. And then you, you just express that in whatever way seems best to you. Man, when I was 10, I had no clue. I thought I was gonna be a Harlem Globetrotter, okay? Like I had no idea who I was. That's funny on a few levels, okay? But 
we just don't know. And, we, and then we go through other seasons. When you, when you move out of the house for the first time, you live on your own. There's this kind of idea, like, who am I when I don't have somebody to do my laundry for me? I don't know who I am. When we, if you get married, if you have a child, if you get divorced, you're, you're going through all of these, if you change careers, these questions about who I am, and we really don't know. So to look inside I mean, we can do that, but a lot of times all we're going to see is a lot more question marks than answers. We're not really qualified to know who we are. Well, what does that leave? If, if they can't tell me who I am and I can't tell me who I am, who gets to tell me who I am? Only, only one person, the one who created me, who made me, who knows me inside and out, who loves me, who wants what's best for me and will always speak truth to me. God is the only one who can tell me who I am. So part of our time when we are regularly connecting with God, being self-fed, is to ask God, would you remind me who I am? Because it gets confusing out there. There are a lot of other voices who wanna tell me who I am, including my own, and, and I get lost in that. So God, I need you to remind me who I am. And the second um, question that we go to when we connect regularly with God is to ask, where am I going? What, what am I here for? How do I know which direction to go? Which direction are you going? It, it kind of depends on where you want to end up, doesn't it? If, if where you want to end up, if we're followers of Jesus and we say, I, I, I want to end up at a place where I get to hear God say those words over me, well done, good and faithful servant. That's where I want to end up. Is that the direction that your life is taking you? See, see we gotta, we've had to evaluate this. If I say, like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm headed to Chicago today, but I jump on Interstate 65 and head south, it's gonna be a while. I mean, geographically, it can work, but it's gonna be a while, okay? I can't say I wanna get here and then head off in a different direction. I need course correction constantly. I need to ask God, remind me where I'm going. Remind me which direction I should be moving so what I want to look at here for a moment is how Jesus modeled this for us, spending time regularly with God to check his identity and direction, and then kind of glean from that some practices that we can use to be self-fed. Okay, we're going to begin in Luke chapter 3, verse 21. If you see something on the screen underlined, that's your part, please read it aloud. Especially you, second row, I'm looking at you. So that's, a, that's the world changer row. We're gonna rename it. Okay, here we go. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. So Jesus is in this process of being obedient to God through baptism. Did Jesus have to be baptized like we need to be baptized for forgiveness of his sin? No, he didn't need that. But he was being obedient to God, and he told John it was to fulfill righteousness. So Jesus is baptized, and in this moment, God chooses to speak out his identity to him. Hey, just, just so you know, just to remind you, you are my son. I love you. I am pleased with you. Why did Jesus need this? Did he not know who he was? It seemed like he had a sense of his identity from the time at least that he was 12 and he told his parents, didn't you know I was gonna be in my father's house, right? Being about his business. He, he knew who he was, but he's about to go into this ministry where there are gonna be a lot of voices shouting other things at him about his identity. There are gonna be other people who have their own ideas about who he is. Some called him demon-possessed. Some called him a sinner because he was a friend of sinners. Some called him the next military and political leader of Israel. And Jesus needed in this moment to be rooted in his identity. You are my son whom I love. And you, I am well pleased. Let's move on to Luke chapter nine later on in his ministry. We'll see this again. About eight days after Jesus said this, Okay, so just pause for a second. We recognize that even though we are talking about being self-fed, this is not something that we do alone, okay? That Jesus is inviting, he's going to pray, right? 
And he's inviting people along with him, Peter, James, and John, to go with him on this journey. As he's connecting with God to be rooted in his identity, he's, he's doing it with others. So as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. All right, so Moses and Elijah show up, which is weird, okay? Can we just acknowledge this is really strange? We read it like, oh, this happens all the time to Jesus. He's just hanging out with Moses and Elijah. No, this happened one time to one person ever, and it's crazy, really cool. So what are they talking about? Are they talking, is is Moses like, hey man, have have the people, have the Israelites gotten any better? Because in my day, they were a real pain in the rear, you know? Like, is that what they're talking about? No, they're talking about Jesus's departure. Where is he going? And what does he have to do to get there? His departure is this time when he's going to be crowned king of God's kingdom and ascend to his rightful place at the throne. But he's gotta go through Jerusalem first. That's what they're talking about. Let's pick up in verse 34. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, All right, so Jesus, I mean, he's hiked up this mountain to connect with God, to spend time with God, and in doing so, he receives confirmation about who he is and where he's going. This voice again speaks, but this time it's not addressing Jesus directly, but those around Jesus. And he's, God is telling them, hey, in case you missed it, this really is my son and you should pay attention to everything he says and does. And so Jesus gets this confirmation about his identity and direction at a very crucial moment in his life and ministry. Let's continue. While everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. But they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them so that they did not grasp it. And they were afraid to ask him about it. So Jesus is now telling the disciples his direction. Hey, I I am confident in who I am. I know where I'm going and I want you to know where I'm going. And it's gonna be painful for a while. It's gonna be uncomfortable. And they just couldn't wrap their minds around Jesus choosing to go into pain and suffering. But this is exactly what he did. A few verses later, we read this. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven... So again, his destination is where? It's, it's his rightful place as king of the kingdom. That's where he's going. But the path to get there goes through Jerusalem, through pain and humiliation and suffering and ultimately crucifixion. How can he do this? How, how can he keep to a path that he knows is going to lead him into pain? Because he knows who he is and he knows what's on the other side of that. We read in Hebrews 12, that it was for the joy set before him that he endured the cross. For the joy set before him. Not because the cross was a joyful place to be, it was the opposite of that, but because of what was on the other side of that. This opportunity to be fulfilled in his obedience and his purpose, and Jesus embraces his identity and his direction. And this is the model for us. When we connect with God regularly, as Jesus did, we're reminded of who we are and where we're going. And this just brings clarity. It just brings clarity, doesn't it? So many of our um, decisions and the things that we stress about and we get anxious about and we get sad about are, are moments when we're just, we're just not clear on who we are and where we're going. Something has happened to disrupt our clarity. So we need this built into our lives. The way we... Uh, teach and talk about this in our um, spiritual growth and spiritual formation courses um, is we we talk about um, the daily office and a rule of life. And these are just frameworks for our time to connect regularly with God. It kind of provides a structure so that um, we build this into the rhythm of our lives. Just like your eating habits, you have eating habits or you eat certain times every day, right? And that's, that's a good thing is so that you don't forget or so that you don't eat all the time. It's you, you build it in um, to the structure of your day. And this is 
what we encourage all followers of Jesus to do is build this time with God into your day through um, what, what we call the daily office or rule of life. If you want more information about that, um, you can ask us about that later and we can uh, kind of break that down for you. But this is the model that Jesus set out for us so that we, we will be self-fed um, about our identity and our direction. So how do we do it? I, w- I wanna give you some steps um, for each of our core values. We're gonna have steps toward Jesus-centered living. All of these values are taking us in a direction. That direction is toward Jesus-centered living. So uh, our steps are gonna revolve around three actions, and that is prioritize, embrace, and resist. So what do we need to prioritize if we're gonna be self-fed? We need to prioritize the truth about who God says you are. That has to be the priority. That has to be the loudest voice in our, in our heads, in our hearts, when it comes to who we are. And we've gotta make that a priority. How do we do that? I, I think it's really helpful and important to search the scriptures, see what God really says about you, and commit those truths to memory. We went through a few of them in Emily's prayer time earlier, Ephesians 2.10. For you are God's masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for you. 1 John 3.1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the sons and daughters of God. And if you you search scripture for um, truth about your identity, you'll find it. And then you just bury those in your heart through memorization so that when you're struggling, when you're wrestling, when you're off base, off kilter with your identity, you can just fall back, take a breath and go, nope, I'm God's masterpiece. I'm created for good works. That's who I am. That's the truth. So we've got to prioritize the truth about who God says you are. Uh, Second, we need to embrace this identity in Christ. That seems obvious, but we we need to embrace it and not argue with God about it, which we do sometimes. God looks at us and says, you're you're my beloved child. And we go, I don't don't feel that. I don't feel like I am. I really screwed up. And I don't think you could possibly love me after what I did. Don't argue with him. If he says you're loved, you're loved. Leave it. Embrace it. But second, we need to embrace the discomfort of moving against the current because that's what we're gonna have to do. If we're going to live out our identity in Christ and we're gonna move in the direction that God leads us, it is going to cause us friction with the culture around us. There are gonna be things that we do that everybody else is not doing. There are gonna be positions that we take that other people aren't taking. There are gonna be choices, behaviors, rhythms that we adopt that that the people around us are not adopting. And that's uncomfortable to feel like you're standing out, to feel like you're not a part of what everyone else is doing. So we've just got to embrace that discomfort. It's just part of the part of the deal. Jesus explains it like this in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 or 7, uh, 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. The path that Jesus invites us to walk is a difficult path, partly because not a lot of people are gonna wanna go with us. When we start to make choices that honor God with every moment of our lives, we're gonna find that there's a lot of people who don't really wanna walk that path with us. That's why church family is so important, by the way, because we get to look around this room and go, okay, I'm not the same as these people. These people are different. Some of them are just odd ducks, but we're moving in the same direction. At least I know that, at least I know that we're headed in the same direction together. I'm not alone in this, but it's still a difficult path. And we've got to embrace sometimes when we, when we encounter that friction, especially students, you young people, you're awesome. You, you guys are setting the tone at your schools. I know you are, but there's friction when you do that. When you don't talk like the other students, you don't tell the same kind of jokes. You don't treat people the same way. It creates friction. Can you, are you okay with that? Can you deal with that? That's an important part of embracing your identity in Christ. And then finally, we need to resist voices that misdirect. Jesus was surrounded by people who wanted to tell him something different about his identity and his direction. And at one point, he tells the disciples that he's, he's going to Jerusalem to be crucified. And Peter, the nerve of the guy, grabs Jesus, pulls him aside and says, that's not right. No, we don't talk like that around here. We're not, that is not gonna happen to you. Peter has his own ideas about Jesus' identity and direction, and it's wrong. 
Even though Peter loves Jesus, Peter's devoted to Jesus. He's wrong about Jesus' identity and direction in this moment. Where does Jesus say that comes from? He says, get behind me, Satan. Ouch. That, that's false. That's a lie about my identity and direction. And the lies come from the enemy. And I'm not gonna listen to that. I know who I am. I know where I'm going. So when we talk about resisting voices that misdirect, sometimes this includes people who love us, people who actually want what's best for us, but they just don't know us like God knows us. People who love you can speak inadvertently, unintentionally, can speak falsehoods to you about your identity and direction. That's why it's so important that we connect with God regularly and ask him, would you please remind me who I am and where I'm going? Because it gets crazy out there. It gets crazy in my head. Like there are things, I'm, I'm hearing all of these ideas about what kind of person I should be and how I should do this and where I should land on that issue. And I just, I, I need a rock to stand on. God, would you remind me who I am and where I'm going? And as we learn to ask that question regularly, it, it builds this confidence in us that creates clarity so that when we come to crossroads, when we have decisions to make, when we have conflict with people that we love, we are rooted in our identity in Christ and our direction toward Jesus-centered living. And that just sounds like freedom, doesn't it? You know what else it sounds like? It sounds like a city on a hill. It sounds like if, there, if there's a group of people in a community who are committed to rooting their identity and direction in who God says they are, those people are gonna shine bright. Those people are gonna stand out. They, they may not be like everybody wants them to be, but they're gonna get attention. And people are gonna look at us and go, I, I don't know what it is about you and I'm not sure I buy everything you believe, but that kind of clarity, that kind of freedom, I want that. Talk to me about that. And we get a chance to share with people what God is doing in our lives by clarifying our identity and direction for us. So that's our core value of being self-fed, that we are going to check our identity and direction regularly. So maybe you have a habit already of reading scripture and praying. I hope you do. If you don't, now's a good time to start. You can start that habit today. But maybe even in your habit, this is not something that comes to mind often. So I just wanna encourage you to write this down, make a note, set an alarm to check your identity and direction with God. God, would you remind me today who I am and where I'm going? And let that create clarity and provide freedom for you as you move in the direction of Jesus-centered living. Uh, we're gonna close with a word of prayer. Would you all stand? Oh, no, we're not gonna close. Um, you can stand, but it'll be awkward. So go ahead and sit. Uh, my apologies. I, so this is kind of, this is new. So uh, in first service, we had a celebration, a baptism, uh, Mark Carter, and I can't let you leave until you get to see this. But this morning and then the past couple of days, I've really found myself in a space of excitement and a space of gratitude. And um, I've really been grateful for the work that the Spirit has been doing in my heart and just the, the challenges and stuff that has been put in front of me. And also very grateful for the people that God's put in my life um, that have been a part of this journey leading up to it with people that will be a part of this journey moving forward. Um, and excited for today, but also excited just to see what, what happens. Uh, being a part of this church and being a part of God's family. So um, I'm excited that you're all here today and to share it with you. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Senior Kid, I have a mere confession of faith. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the Son of God. He's my Lord and Savior. He's my Lord and Savior. Amen. So, Mark, on your confession of faith, to baptize in the the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you guys know Mark, you need to check in with him about his story. It's just a beautiful story, uh, and we're celebrating with him today. So now you can stand. 
And I think just, just what Mark has demonstrated through this whole uh, pro- journey for him is the willingness to let God define for him who he is and where he's going has just been beautiful. So uh, I encourage you, if baptism is something that you've been thinking about, it's on your mind, uh, please come, give us a call, shoot us an email, come and talk to us. We'd love to walk you through that. So um, as we leave, uh, I just wanna invite you to pray that God will remind you this week who you are and where you're going. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you um, that you know us and care about us enough to speak truth into our lives about who we are. We are your beloved children, even when we're at our worst. We are people that Jesus died for. And I just pray that you would root us in our identity as people that you have um, empowered to live lives of peace and joy and purpose and that we would move in the direction of Jesus-centered living together and that you would just bring people to your son through our humility and, and willingness to, to trust you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being here. You are sent to be salt and light in a world that desperately needs Christ. God bless you.